In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance family conversation. And as always, it's great to be with you. And um, we like to start off our conversation always by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary, of course, is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We also cry out to Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So as we start off this new week, let us uh, turn to Mary and ask Mary to pray with us as well as to pray for us. So let's uh, pray together the prayer that Mary loves most, and that is the <clears throat> that is the Hail Mary. Together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the, is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is known as the paraclete. Holy Spirit is no, also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as the interior master. The great apostle St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, his most developed theolog theological letter, says in chapter 8 that we don't know how to pray as we ought. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Abba, which means daddy or father. So let's um, ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten our intellect and set our hearts on fire with the love of God himself. As we say, Come, Holy Spirit, Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. Archangel Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and this is the day the Lord has made. 
Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Every Sunday, we celebrate, my friends, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the day of the week in which we rejoice. Principally because every Sunday we celebrate our Lord's <coughs> rising from the dead. Sunday is like a mini Easter in which we thank our Lord for having died for us, but also for having risen from the dead. So this is a day in which we rejoice. For that reason we say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And as always, I'll be praying for all of you in the Mass that I celebrate today. I'll be placing you on the altar. And of course, my friends, the way in which we can most fully live out the way in which you can most fully live out the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection, is by going to Mass and by participating fully, actively, consciously in the greatest of all prayers. That prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place all of you on the altar in the Mass I'll celebrate today. And I'd like to pray these, in, these intentions for you. First, I'd like to pray for your pursuit of of holiness that all of you myself included would make a concerted effort on our part to grow in holiness as Jesus says be holy as your Heavenly Father is holy so that's my first intention. And you notice at the beginning of our conversation, we prayed to Mary, we prayed to the Holy Spirit. Then I have a litany of saints that I pray to. Because these saints, they're part of our Perseverance family. I invoke them and I invite them to accompany us, to pray with us and to pray for us and to encourage us on our journey to heaven. That we would not be discouraged, but that we would fight the good fight, run the good race, knowing that the merited crown is waiting for us. My second intention, I'd like to pray for your families. The family is the domestic church, as Vatican II highlights. And also, St. Pope John Paul II has stated that the family is the basic building block of society. The basic building block of society, that's right. And John Paul II also says the way <coughs> that the family goes is the way that the society goes. And world history has pointed out that when the strong empires or civilizations have crumbled and disintegrated, it's primarily when the family, the basic building block of society, the family, has fallen apart. So I'd like to pray for all of your families and placing them on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Last but not least, pray that all of us would have a great ardent desire to pray. In my 
my catechetical motivation would be the following, asking you to pray. I've already entered into the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius' program, and we're already into the second week in the group we have in Alhambra on Tuesday, and today we'll be entering into the second week of the spiritual exercises in St. Peter Chanel. Also, I'll be starting the second week of the exercises in Spanish on Thursday. So I invite all of you to <coughs> pray for the spiritual exercises. And maybe some of you are actually doing the spiritual exercises with me. In person, we're doing them person at St. Peter Chanel today at 1.30. Then St. Uh, St. John the Baptist, Tuesdays, and St. Therese on Thursdays. We have a lot of people that are doing these exercises, pretty big numbers. But I'd like to ask you that these people who have started off, that they would persevere. It's a spiritual marathon of 10 weeks, which will take us all the way through the season of Lent up to Easter all the way through the season of Lent up to Easter. So the marathon is a long race. Therefore, I'd like to ask you to, to pray for our retreatants that God would give them many, many, many graces. So today uh, we celebrate our Lord's resurrection from the dead. And I'd like to offer all these special prayers for you. But right now, I'd like to enter into our topic for the day. So on Sundays, you know, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we have a very exquisite spiritual banquet, so to speak. We have the Word of God, then we have the Body and Blood of Christ, which is the Eucharist. And the Word of God that we have consists of three readings and the Responsorial Psalm. So the first reading today we have is taken from the book of Samuel, where we see the real nobility of, of David before he becomes a king, and like to expound upon that. Then we have the responsorial psalm, which is taken from Psalm 103. And the antiphon is short but very poignant. And it can be part of our prayer life. That is, the Lord is kind and merciful. Two attributes of the heart of Christ. The Lord is kind and merciful. We are also called to be kind and merciful as God is. Then over the past four weeks, the second reading has been taken from St. Paul and his letter to the Corinthians. So we've arrived at 1 Corinthians 15. And this is basically St. Paul gives us a contrast between our, our first father, Adam, and the second Adam. And the second Adam is Christ. And basically, <clears throat> our, our two natures, our fallen nature because of original sin, and our redeemed, our redeemed nature through Christ, and through, through us being inserted in Christ, grafted into Christ through the sacrament of baptism. Then the gospel, we return to St. Luke chapter 6, <coughs> And it's extension of the, you have the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Then in St. Luke, you have the Sermon on the Plain, where Jesus challenges us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us and to bless those who curse us. 
and to pray for those who mistreat us. This is very, very difficult. This is very difficult. But we have to do it. It's very difficult, but we have to do it. If we want to receive mercy, then we have to give mercy. As Jesus says, be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. So, there we have an overview. There we have a panoramic there we have a panoramic uh, vision of of the reading for today. And I'd like to go through them and see how we can apply the Word of God to ourselves. Never forget that when we're reading the Word of God, even though they were written many years ago, the Word of God is like a two-edged sword that separates bone from marrow. It's a two-edged sword that separates bone from marrow. And uh, I invite all of you to um, invite all of you to follow a method. The method that I've composed over the past year and a half is pretty simple, but it can be very applicable to your meditation, very efficacious in deriving abundant copious fruits from your meditations. And it's this, to read the Word of God, try to memorize the basic content, then try to glean what is the, what is the primary message that is being conveyed. And then what is the message conveyed to you? So there's a general message, then there is a personal message. And the fifth point is to apply it to your own life. So the Word of God is not something simply academic or theoretical, something ethereal up there in the skies, but the Word of God should be applied to our own lives. It should be applied to our own lives. So, that being the case, let's, uh, let's dive into the infinite ocean of God's Word. And we start, we start with the Old Testament, and we start with the first book of Samuel. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, present to you a... Um, a much more extensive context of this so you can understand where we're, what the Word of God is saying in, in its full meaning. And then, how can we apply this to ourselves? By the way, a liturgical note, I'm giving talks on the Mass uh, every Friday, and I'm going through the Mass, I haven't arrived specifically at the Mass, but I'm concentrating and giving uh, ideas on the Mass, and we'll go through the Mass just one step at a time. But, this has to be said, that the Sunday Mass, the first reading and the Gospel reading, the first and third reading, normally you're going to notice a common thread, a similar theme as is the case today. So, this is the, this is the first reading. I'll give you a, an extensive overview of it. And if you go to daily Mass, we've actually, over the past, over the past two months, we've basically gone through this first reading that we have today, in the daily readings. Okay, David. David has been, was chosen from being a shepherd, the son of Jesse. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel. And it says that ever since he was anointed that the Holy Spirit rushed upon him. That's right. The Holy Spirit rushed upon him. 
So, he, after being anointed, he goes to Saul the king and offers his services. Now, Saul is a tall, handsome, strong, capable king, but also a warrior. Because the king was also back then, he would be the five-star general, okay? That's right. The king would be the five-star general of the army. So Saul was the leader-in-chief. So Saul is winning battle after battle, and David shows up on the scene. So David shows up on the scene. <clears throat> and what happens is that the enemies of the Jews, the typical enemies are the Philistines, they challenge the Israelites to a one-on-one -on -one duel. A one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, the Israelites should choose their best soldier and the Philistines to choose their best. And then they would have a one-on-one -on -one battle. So the, the Israelites accepted this, but they were not sure who to choose. Saul did not, <laughs> Saul did not um, accept the challenge. Philistines already had someone in mind. Who was that? That was Goliath. You probably know the story. Goliath was tall, strong, muscular, ferocious. He had his, he had his uh, sword. He had his shield. He was malicious. He breathed threats of murder. He'd won, he'd won many battles. In other words, a very accomplished soldier. <laughs> Excuse me. He would scare anyone. So Saul is there, and David runs to the line and says, I will fight him. What a contrast. So David is much smaller. David has no military experience. <laughs> uh, Goliath has a huge sword. David, David doesn't have that. David just has a slingshot. And David has five stones little stones for a slingshot. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so David offers his David offers himself to fight against Goliath. Now for all intents and purposes if you look at this little David with a slingshot, fighting Goliath with a huge sword, as well as a shield and a shield bearer, practically it would be impossible. Impossible for him to win the battle. <laughs> you know the battle. Goliath looks at David, despises him, curses him, and says that he will chop off his head and throw his body to the birds of the field. David, undaunted, unafraid, courageous because he's trusting God, runs to the battlefield and says, you come in the name of your false gods. I come in the name of the Lord of heaven and earth. So David runs to the battlefield, to the line. And Goliath approaches. And David takes out one stone from his pouch, puts it in his slingshot, and he aims and he launches it. And he launches it. 
and it rivets in the forehead of the giant. And the giant comes, he falls to his knees, cascades to the ground, lies prostrate on the earth, and David overlooking him, and with the own sword of Goliath, David dispatches it, and he cuts off the head of Goliath. Victory. Victory. He cuts off the head of Goliath. Victory. So there's, there's the beginning of the ascension of David. And then what happens as a result of this, a result of this, David, David goes off to battle, as well as Saul, and David is winning battle after battle after battle after battle. All these battles. Saul is winning too. But not as many battles as David is. So the culmination of this, which takes us into the reading today, is the following. David has won many battles. And with his soldier, he's killed many of his enemies. So, the Israelites are walking in procession into Jerusalem, and there is a, a parade. <clears throat> and the Jewish maidens are singing as Saul listens. He's walking in the procession, and the Jewish handmaids sing out, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. So with sistrums and tambourines, the young women are dancing with glee and joy because of David's victories, but Saul's victories. Now Saul, upon hearing this song, that David has killed his ten thousands and Saul just his thousands, <clears throat> The devil starts to work on him. And what happens? The devil starts to work on him. And the devil of envy gets a hold of him. That's right. And Saul is thinking, ah. They're, credit they're crediting David with <coughs> 10,000 and me only with 1,000. He's just lacking the crown. So, so from that moment, the devil of envy and jealousy got a hold of Saul and filled him with poison, with the venom of the poison of jealousy and envy, which led to anger and bitterness and hatred. So what has happened? To understand the first reading, we're building up to it, is that King Saul <coughs> has already tried to kill David more than once. Once he throws a spear at David and David avoid, dodges the, the spear. But Saul has tried to kill David more than once. So as a result of this, David has to flee. But David has already built up his own followers, his friends and followers, among which his most faithful follower is a man named Abishai, a loyal friend and follower of David, Abishai. So it happens that
Saul is pursuing David with 3,000 men in the desert of Ziph. So what has happened? <coughs> that night, God has placed a deep slumber, a deep slumber over Saul, Abner, who should be protecting Saul, and all the army of Saul. And David has his followers in another place. So David approaches, David approaches Saul and sees him sound asleep with his spear right next to his head. So Abishai says to David, the Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands. Give me one opportunity and I will nail him to the ground. It'll take one thrust and it'll be over. What does David do? David turns to Abishai and says, Look, I will not harm the anointed one of God. Even though he's trying to kill me, I will not, I will not harm the anointed of the Lord. So then, going across the opposite slope, David stood on the remote hilltop at a great distance from Abner and he cries out, Here is the king's spear. Let an attendant come to cover to get it. The Lord will reward each man for his justice and faithfulness. Today, though, the Lord delivered you into my grasp. I would not harm the Lord's anointed. So you see that David could have, <clears throat> David could have taken the king's spear. He could have done it himself, for Abishai, his faithful friend, could have killed Saul. But he did not. He did not. <clears throat> so we really see the great nobility of David, which David could have ended the life of King Saul right away. Right away. But he did not. He decided not to do that. Now, we see the real noble character of David. And eventually what's going to happen is Saul is going to be declining more and more and more. Saul, God has departed from Saul and Saul is going to consult a witch at Endor. And he's going to be trying to summon back to life Samuel, who's passed away. So you know what's what is, what will be his future? Because Saul is now fighting. Fight, Saul will be fighting against his enemies, but God has left him, and Saul will eventually fall upon his own sword, thereby committing suicide, ending his own life. So, so we see the dynamic of what happened to Saul. Jealousy, envy, bitterness, anger, rancor, hatred, trying to kill an innocent man. He ends up by killing himself. He ends up by actually killing himself. That's right. Now, the response to real psalm says, The Lord is kind and merciful. We see how kind and merciful 
we see how kind and merciful was David. And because of this, David, after Saul dies, will be chosen to be the king of the Israelites. He'll rule over Hebron for 70 years and then over Jerusalem for 33 years. For 40 years, he'll be ruling over the Israelites. Now, I, I think you're going to see the parallel between the mercy, the kindness, the forgiveness, the compassion of David and the gospel. And the gospel. So just listen. Listen attentively to the first couple verses of the gospel today. Jesus said, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mis mistreat you. Wow. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray <coughs> for those who mistreat you. These are the words, my friends, these are the words, my friends, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you can see how these words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were put into practice <coughs> They are put into practice by, by David. Now I'd like to apply this now to our own lives. My friends, let's be honest. In our lives, people are going to hurt us. We'll hurt them, too. It's a two-way street. But people will hurt us. How? They'll hurt us. Sometimes people hurt us physically. If not, people hurt us verbally, by words. People can hurt us emotionally by certain pressures or attitudes. People can hurt us socially or culturally. People can hurt us economically. People can hurt us when they're driving on the freeway. People can hurt us at work. There are many, many, many ways in which we can be hurt. And most often, most often we're hurt in the context of our family. The context of our family. In which our family members hurt us and we hurt our family members. <clears throat> I think what we should try to do is imitate David and try to listen and to put into practice the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the Gospel of St. Matthew, especially Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, St. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. What I'd like to do is like to tell you a story A story that can be very helpful for us to 
to forgive and to be merciful. This was a um, a homily that was sent to Father Craig about about two years ago. And it was a, a homily that was given by a priest whose name is Father Dave for Mercy Sunday. That's right, for Mercy Sunday. So I'd like to lay it out for you. In this story I'm going to be developing is very much related to what David did and what our Lord challenges us to do. And it's this. And it's this. One occasion there was a, a young man, his name was Dave, who was a seminarian, who was driving in his car with a couple other seminarians. And they're driving down the street and this drunk driver, this undocumented drunk driver, was driving full speed through a red light and rammed into the car of Dave and his companions. Now, none of them were killed, thanks be to God, nor hurt seriously, physically, but the car was totaled. And the drunken driver was an undocumented person, so there's no way any insurance could have been applied to, for Dave to, re, to get a new car. So when he returned to the seminary, he was very, very angry at this man that ruined his car. Very angry. Understandably so, this, you might say, a, a righteous anger. So he decides to speak with his spiritual director. His spiritual director. And he tells his spiritual director that he's just very, very angry at this drunken driver, undocumented, that rammed into his car and Thanks be to God he wasn't killed and his companions, but the car was totaled. So no way of getting a new car. So his spiritual director listens to this story very attentively. Very attentively. And after listening, his spiritual director says this. Well, Dave, I heard you. I mean, Dave was basically fuming against this drunken driver. Very angry. The spiritual director says, okay, what you should do is this. I'll give you advice. Try to follow my advice. Starting today, this should be your prayer. Lord, Bless that drunken driver that totaled my car. Bless him. And change my heart. Change me. Upon hearing this advice of his spiritual director, Dave was shocked. Why should I pray to bless this man? He's the one that did the damage, not me. It should really be the other way around. It should really be the other way around. Which means that
God should bless me and God has to change that man. But his spiritual director held his ground and said, no, Dave, that's not the way it should be. You have to say, Lord, bless him. Lord, bless him and change me. So David, hearing this, was really shocked. But he humbly submitted to his spiritual director. So from that day on, what did he do? He started to pray that God would bless the man that almost killed him. Pray for the man that almost killed him. And he begged the Lord to change his heart. Right away the first day or two, there didn't seem to be any real real change in the heart of Dave. However, after about after about a month, remember Dave had a real resentment, a real anger. A real resentment, a real anger against this man, and in a certain sense it was justified because he was drunk, he ran through the red light, he almost killed Dave, so it was a kind of a just, justified anger. But after about a month, something happened. Something happened. And it's David's heart started to change. And he no longer had any anger, resentment, bitterness, much less hatred against his drunken driver. But he was able to really forgive him totally from his heart. The man was blessed and David's heart was changed. Yesterday I gave a homily on this in the sad evening mass. And I gave a I gave an analogy. <laughs> and it's this. I was brought up and raised on the East Coast in New York and New Jersey. Then I studied in Philadelphia. So I was brought up and raised in the East Coast. So this time of the year, from December all the way up to usually late March, sometimes even into April, I was accustomed to a lot of a lot of, a lot of snowfall. And the snow would really come down. And in parking lots, the snow plows would would push the snow into a huge mound. And that huge mound of snow, it would not melt right away would sometimes take days, even weeks, for the sun to come out and to melt that mound of snow. It was a gradual process. So I use that as an analogy of what happened to Dave. When people heard us, and it's going to happen until we die. When people heard us in word, in gesture, could be a cold silence, could be emotional abuse, could be physical abuse, it could be prejudices, 
there are 101 different ways in which people can can hurt us. Many ways. <clears throat> and we have to we have to decide. It's up to us to decide. That's right. We have to decide. What are we going to do? We can either decide within our hearts to be angry against the person, resentful against the person, to be vindictive, to want to seek out revenge. We all are born with the lay of Talion, the eye for eye and tooth for tooth. We're born with this law of strict justice and even vengeance within our hearts. We can live with anger, bitterness, resentment, a desire to revenge, we can live with that. It's up to us. We're free. That can be our choice. We can live with that. Or we can decide, we can decide to forgive that person. It's up to us. It's up to us. <clears throat> so it's either it's either anger, bitterness, rancor, and seeking out revenge in one way or another. Or it's love mercy, compassion, forgiveness, what the Responsorial Psalm says, the Lord is kind and merciful, the Lord is slow to anger and rich in kindness and mercy. So it's either, either revenge and anger or mercy and forgiveness. We have to choose. We have to choose. It's up to us. We have to choose. It's up to us. Now, I, I, I like proverbs, I like sayings, I like language, as you know, I like puns, I like stories, I like literature, I like to preach and teach, I like to be with all of you. However, language can be a two-edged sword. It can be used properly or it can be abused, human language. And what I'd like to say is this. There are some cliches or proverbs which have an element of truth Proverbs is used condensed wisdom through the ages. That could be a definition of a proverb. Condensed, condensed wisdom through the ages. But often there is a half truth in them, but also that means there's a half a lie. It's not fully true. And one of these I like to apply to what we're talking about. And it's this. You've You've all heard this many, many, many times. Almost as if it's a trite and hackneyed phrase, as we say in literature. And it's this. Forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. I don't, I don't believe that that's possible. Forgive and forget. Unless you have Alzheimer's 
or dementia. In that case, so, because of the physical disintegration of our nature, which comes as a result of original sin, you do forget. But if we do not have Alzheimer's and dementia, then we cannot always forget things that have happened to us. We have our memory bank and we also have our subconscious life, that which is stored in our archives upstairs. Therefore, we, we cannot always forget when people have hurt us. We can't. However, we must forgive. That's true. There's a moral imperative to forgive. And I'll prove it. It's the first reading today and the gospel. And Jesus says, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. And listen, listen, it's the our Father. When we pray the Our Father, we say, what? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Therefore, it is incumbent upon ourselves, if we indeed want to be forgiven by our Heavenly Father, then we have to forgive those who have hurt us. It's a two-way street. So my friends, the readings today are very rich and very applicable to our lives. So I'd like to bless all of us, bless you, so that all, all will be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful, so that we would receive mercy from our Heavenly Father. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.